Hello, everyone. I'm I'm very sorry I I couldn't be there today with you with with our team to share the film with you all. Uh, I'm a victim of the plague. <laughs> um, thank you to the Boston Jewish Film Festival for for showing it. And were it not for the the support and uh, and encourage of our producer Eva Nesco, this film would not come to be. Thanks to her extraordinary efforts. Uh, Jan Karski's lesson is now available to more and more people uh, at this critical time in uh, our history when the world needs, uh, well, desperately needs what he exemplifies. And it has been an honor and, and, and continues to be an honor and a, and a privilege uh, of mine to be a part of this uh, this project. And uh, we hope that uh, you, you leave today knowing that no matter how insignificant you may feel, that there is something that you can do, uh, as Karski urges us to do, uh, to take care of each other. Um, well, all the best. Thank you. Hi again. I am Lisa Gossels, Artistic Director of Boston Jewish Film. Thank you for joining us for this conversation with co-writer and director Derek Goldman, producer Eva Anisko, and co-writer Clark Young. Welcome to you all. Bravo. This is my third time seeing your film, but it's my first time seeing it on a big screen, and I was in tears at the end. We need to hear these words more than ever. I feel like I need to do a class, which is probably being taught, on Jan Karski, because his words are so resonant today. And we'll be diving into lots of things. I want to get your bios done, but I just want to say, I know this is a labor of love for all of you, and a huge labor, and we're going to learn about how this started as a play and became this film, and we're gonna get into Jan Karski's words. I just wanna congratulate you on, it's a masterpiece, it's a masterwork. I mean, first it's the words and Jan Karski, and the acting and directing, but then it's the, the lighting design, the set design, which we could really analyze and go into, the, the sound design, the music, every aspect of this, it is just a masterpiece. Um, so anyway, thank you for being here. Um, I'm first going to read your bios, and then I know this is somewhat of a homecoming for all of you, so I want to give you that chance to say hello, and then we'll have a conversation, and you'll all be part of it. And a reminder for us, because there are so many people here, we'll like, repeat questions that are asked of us, so everybody can hear. Okay, so Derek Goldman. Derek Goldman is the artistic and executive director and co-founder of the Laboratory for Global Performance and Politics at Georgetown University where you know that Jan Karski taught for four decades, with a mission to harness the power of performance to humanize global politics. In addition to his 18 years at Georgetown as professor in both performing arts and the School of Foreign Service, he's an award-winning director, producer, playwright, adapter, developer of new work, festival director, educator, and published scholar. His artistic work has been seen off-Broadway and at dozens of leading theaters throughout the nation and the world. Welcome, Derek. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Lisa. It's great to be here. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Eva, you're the first person I met on this crew, and I'm just so thrilled to be meeting you in person as well. Eva's an award-winning producer, and I had to cut everybody's bios here, with experience spearheading social issue documentaries, news and public affairs series, and multi-platform programming, including the Emmy award-winning documentary, The Army of Light, directed by Abigail Disney, Blueprint America, Emmy award-winning expose, America's Investigative Reports, and the sustainable design series, Design E2, narrated by Brad Pitt, as soon as Eva experienced, remember this, the lesson of Jan Karski on stage, she saw its potential as a powerful film to reach larger audiences. Eva, you're part of this miracle too. Thank you.
And last and not least, Clark Young. Clark Young is a writer and teacher based in Brooklyn and originally from Portland, Maine. He co-created every iteration of Remember This, The Lesson of Jan Karski, since its first stage reading in 2014. Clark is currently workshopping his new play, Point Four Zero Six Below, about the cryonic freezing of baseball legend Ted Williams. <laughs> Different subject matter, sounds fascinating. Um, so before I ask a first question, which is really going to be for all of you, any welcomes or I know this is kind of a homecoming. You all have some ties to this. Any welcomes, my goodness. Region. Um, no, just to say thank you, Lisa, and the festival. It's such a, um, it is a homecoming for, um, for us, uh, for Clark and I as New Englanders. Um, it's really, uh, really moving to share this here. For us, it's been, a, as, it's been a labor of love for years. We're, um, we're sad that David's not here, but if you squint enough, we look a little bit like him. Um, <laughs> um, no, I'm just to say, um, it's a, the whole jur journey of this piece has been a, about serendipitous relationships. It's, a, you know, I, Karski was a professor at Georgetown where I teach for a long time. I didn't, I knew the outlines of his story, but it took, an occasion in 2014 to lead to this. Uh, it happened that David and I knew each other through a shared relationship to the great oral historian Studs Terkel, and we had collaborated before. If it hadn't been for Studs, this project would have never happened. But if it hadn't been for so many people, for Eva, um, and being back, I went to Brookline High School, there's people in the audience who I went to school with, um, and I was just, you know, the Festival Hotel is in Coolidge Corner, blocks from, my, from where I grew up. And in the 80s, with Facing History, I was first part of Holocaust Theater on a project that some people who are in this room were involved in, led by an incredible Manny and Ryrie 30 some years ago. And you can draw some pretty straight lines between sort of the seeds of those experiences and what we're able to share back today in this community. So it's really special to be here and be part of them. Oh my gosh, thank you, Derek. I feel all that emotion too. It's very, you can't see this and not be. Um, so I guess I have a little connection to Boston. I did go to graduate school here. Um, I did my master's in education at Harvard focusing on arts and education. And so I kind of fell into filmmaking always through the platform first of education and so it is really a privilege and an honor when I could work on a piece that I feel has real deep potential for um, you know, educating students across the board, engaging everyone in conversations. Um, that's really the driver of the work that I kind of take on. Um, and, uh, and, and as Derek said, you know, a, a lot of this has all been serendipitous. It, it came from a, a, a chance encounter. I caught the one-man play um, in London in January 2020 on the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. It was at that point the second time this iteration was performed. And I was blown away. I was moved to tears. I was in my seat, almost not able to, to kind of even, you know, move. It was just so intense. And it resonated with me deeply. You know, I was proud that this came out of Georgetown, where I um, was an alumna. So proud that this, you know, this, this lab linking the School of Foreign Service and the School of Performing Arts um, was established, you know, after the fact of when, when I graduated. But I just thought this is the coolest thing. Um, I'm Polish, I have my own family um, Holocaust history, and so it just resonated on so many levels. And I met Derek, I went to the reception afterward, and I just said, how can I be of service? This is too amazing, too powerful, this can't be a one-off, what are your plans? What can I do to help? And so I approached it you know, through the lens of a, of a filmmaker, because that's you know, my experience and my background, and that's just how things started. And Clark, you mentioned in your bio working on every iteration of the script starting in 2014. Do you want to talk about how you and Derek got together on this and 
uh, you know, yeah. and, and, and what that meant, what the process of writing this and researching this was. Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm from Portland, Maine. Uh, my mom's from Needham by way of Lowell. And uh, I feel uh, <laughs> feel ethically mandated to, to particularly to say to my family who's here today, um, who's, who's come here from Portland and from Boston, um, that uh, just to let them know sincerely that um, the Patriots beat the Colts today, and, uh, and they, they won. And thank you for not. I cast this correctly. Yeah, yeah. Just just saying, everybody. Um, yeah. I don't know if you can see the Patriots socks. <laughs> yeah, I got Tom Brady socks on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah it's, you know. Um, so uh, may he rest in peace. So. Um, uh, I, uh, Derek and I started working on this in 2014. Derek was asked to um, create a stage reading um, to commemorate Karski's centennial at Georgetown. He died in 2000. His bench is on campus. I'd walked by it m my whole uh, time at Georgetown. Um, I was there from 09 uh, on and um, to 2012. And Derek uh, asked me to help him create a piece and, and David almost simultaneously to, to work on this. And it was originally an ensemble piece with students. Uh, um, students walking by the bench as I did and engaging with it, asking a question and sort of igniting the history. And, and, um, and then we went to Warsaw and worked with students from Krakow and that really also um, sort of parallel uh, ignited the, the sort of physical relationship to the play, how embodied their work was as, as, as remarkable actors. And, and David began to sort of pick up on that, as you can see in, in the piece, along with Emma Jaster, our movement director. Um, and then the, we had a residency at the Museum of Jewish Heritage um, in Battery Park, um, where we tried to flesh out the ensemble piece. And, you know, I, I think um, after we performed there, we, we sort of wanted to crack open more fully the audience experiencing what the ensemble was experiencing, which is sort of experiencing Karski's story as the student, right? And, and to have a direct relationship with the audience, we removed the ensemble and uh, created this one-man show. Um, it, the piece is entirely Karski's words, uh, adapted from all kinds of materials and sources that include his memoir, Story of a Secret State, which he wrote in 1944, uh, before the war was ended, um, and it was a book of the month club and a bestseller um, in the United States. Uh, Tom Woods, E. Thomas Woods' um, remarkable biography, Karski, How One Man Tried to Stop the Holocaust, and then oral histories at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, of course, Claude Landsman's Shoah, and the Karski Report, um, and other oral histories at the USC Shoah Foundation, um, as well as archives at the Library of Congress where uh, Pola Norenska's In Memory of Those I Loved Who Are No More is on VHS, um, and we watched it. Uh, so, um, yeah, we're indebted to a, a, an incredible um, army of people who want to tell Karski's story. And, and of course, the play is also heavily influenced by all the people who had him. And I would suspect that, you know, venture to guess there might be a few here today, um, people who had Karski as a teacher and, and loved to speak about him. Um, so. Do we want to ask if anybody is a student of Karski? Are there any students of Karski here? If so, could you raise your hands? No, we have one yeah. there, yeah. Yeah. That's been one of the, for us, as Clark says, you know, We've met hundreds of students of Karski over the journey of this project, and um, it's virtually every time we perform it, there are some in the audience. And, um, you know, I think what's been really special, we just come from six weeks in New York, is actually starting to see some of the students of Karski connect. Obviously, it was a very different experience to be a student of Karski before he, before Showa was shown and before he was sharing this story. So there were different degrees, depending on when you had him, of what you might have known for the most part for decades, students didn't know anything about his history. Um, and later, of course, they did. But it's really beautiful to see relationships forming between people whose bond is having had Karski, sometimes decades apart. Um, there's just a sort of swelling community of people for whom he was a real beacon. Um, and we're you know, privileged to feel like we're kind of um, helping to bring that together a little bit. I mean, this film uh, about the past is absolutely about the present today. It's so almost chillingly, scarily. Karski's words as he's exhorting us through the screen as though we're his students. I mean, it, it all feels like present day. Um, and I'm sure that was your intention in doing this, but I'm sure each time you see it, you almost see it with those fresh eyes of what's happening now in the news. Um, and, um, well, Tell us about working with David. Tell us what that process was like and the preparation and what drew David to this story and what that's been like working with him. 
He's a very difficult man. <laughs> um, no, it, it's really, um, I, I, the, the intuition to reach out to David right away when this project came about was because of really any artist I've ever worked with. He's the most egoless. He's, he's the most, um, and so from the beginning, it happened, and if he were here, he would share this, that um, when I called him, he remembered Karski from having seen Shoa himself decades before. It was at that point like 30 years earlier in, in, in New York, and was really etched in his mind, the memory of Karski. So we already, there was something a little bit, just when he was like, oh yeah, I know, <laughs> that was haunting him and had been haunting him. Um, and then, you know, he's the only person who's ever, we've now, you know, been doing this a long time in fits and starts. We've never had another Karski. He's the only person we've ever heard speak these words as a performer, which is sort of moving given a pandemic and all of the things we've, we've been through. And, um, you know, I, th I think that for David, the thing that has, it's, it's like a, a kind of almost a, what I, like a spiritual virtuosity. I feel like he's still, when he gets ready to perform the play, there are clips of Karski, and you know, he's listening to his voice as he sort of rolls around on his yoga mat. And um, uh, it's nice when he's not here, I can say these things and not embarrass him. Um, <laughs> Ask any questions you want. Yeah. yeah. Uh, um, but um, it's, it's really, really been a very special relationship. And I also think because you know, there's, there's something that's happened between Clark, David, and I, and then it's really expanded in the family with Eva and Jeff, but you know, there are kind of three slightly different generations, um, and there's been a, you know, a lot of this piece was really created with like them in my basement, um, and was created, the reason David is doing this, is the only reason is his sense that Karski's message is, electrically important for this minute and for the present and the future, as you're saying. It has nothing to do with his, um, you know, with any, you know, any kind of careerism or even really like artistry as most actors think about it, like the challenge of the role. It's really about application and urgency. And so just to watch what he goes through and the toll it takes for him to play this role every night and how that keeps him, and he calls it a transfusion that he's really getting from the audience to kind of keep his energy going to be able to keep doing it. Um, so, so it's really been a credible gift to work with him on it. I mean, I, I don't know if you're all aware, but Eva, was it twice at this? How many times was this a play before COVID? Because wasn't the story that two times or more, there were only a few performances and then suddenly you were on a soundstage making this movie and now David is performing this and you're going around the world with this? Yeah, it had just begun, as Eva said, like we had just done a couple of, it had never had a, this is interesting, when we shot the film in Brooklyn, which Eva made happen really through extraordinary circumstances and obstacles in July of 2020, so you can imagine uh, what it took to bring a team together to do this, the show had still never had a proper run. We had done a couple of individual performances. So it wasn't, now the show is very much, you know, it's, it's, it's been in Chicago, in DC, in Bilbao, in New York, it's in David's muscles in a different way. It really wasn't when we shot it. Um, and we should name, there's a, you know, you all know because you saw his work, but not here and equally important as any of us and, and as much of the story of the serendipity of this project is our great collaborator, Jeff Hutchins, who co-directed the film and is the director of photography and Eva had had a previous collaboration with. But we, um, Jeff was the perfect collaborator for this because he too came, you know, at it brought his own singular unique skill set, but with a really profound kind of reverence for Karski and the kind of minimalism and the cinematic nature of the play and the material, um, and then this incredible vision about putting it in black and white and the kind of way it's shot and all of that, which felt, you know, uh, we were talking at lunch. I think had COVID not happened, this film wouldn't exist in this way because the circumstances sort of pushed us to find a way to do it this way. We might have done a capture film or something else, but it really, um, 
and we now feel like we have something really additive and really different than the, th than the play. So. Oh my gosh. You know, um, I know that you both as directors and your lighting designer created a white world, a gray world, and a black world, which works so well. And I just want to compliment on one other thing then maybe one question will open up to everybody. Um, the other thing I found so striking um, was set design, and that when in the last frame you see the table and two empty chairs and empty shoes, and it feels like your film is saying first to listen, then to take a stand, and then I'm gonna cry. Can we each fill Jankarski's shoes, you know? It seems like a very tall order. I personally feel like so much has happened on my watch in these past years and things are happening that I feel like I don't have control over and that's what scares me. That's what scares me because many of us are social justice people, we're doing things in the world and how do we stop what's happening and what has happened in the past? I just wanna read one Elie Wiesel quote because we spoke about that Clark at lunch and maybe you could speak to Elie Wiesel and Jan Karski, that, that connection and then maybe we can open up to everybody. So the quote I just want to share with you, which just was inspired by this film. Uh, Elie Wiesel said, you probably all know this quote, we must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages, encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. Thank you for sharing that. I mean, I, I, in terms of Elie Wiesel's, Elie Wiesel's uh, uh, um, connection to Karski, you know, Landsman found Karski in 1978, and I think actually 77, and it took him about a year to convince him to, to sit down for two days and, and speak for eight, eight to nine hours. Um, and then the film doesn't come out until 1985, so there's this really, what I can only imagine as a, as a, as a sort of incredibly complicated moment in his life where he knows that people are gonna know him soon. Um, and not on his terms, you know, not in his, he's not in the editing room, right? And he's waiting for this film to come out. And Ellie Wiesel comes to him in George, at Georgetown and says, are you Professor Karski? And he says, yes. And he says, are you the Jan Karski? And he says, yes. And he says, um, forgive me, Professor, I thought you were dead. And uh, Karski says, no, you can tell your friends I'm very much alive. Um, and convinced him to speak at the International Liberators Conference in 1981, uh, which is the first time that he publicly spoke, um, you know, and got the chance to actually write what he was going to say. And adapted from that speech is the, um, the piece in the play following the Roosevelt meeting of um, uh, It Haunts Me Now and I Want It To Be So, This Sin Will Haunt Humanity To The End Of Time. Um, uh, that sequence so is from that speech that he wrote, um, where he also references Pola Narenska and the loss of her family, um, which is something that he doesn't often do. Um, any questions or comments? Hi. Was there any collaboration between your production team with the breadth of information from Mr. Kaki and the smallest segment in the Mm. Like it? Yeah. Yes, and actually that's so interesting because that was something I was going to talk about. Was there any connection between this production and the Ken Burns, Lynn Novick documentary series, U.S. and the Holocaust? Yeah, only that the conversation between the two, we didn't, we, there was no, we didn't collaborate. We did, some members of that team, including Lynn, saw the play after it was on, and I got, when we premiered the film at the San Francisco Jewish Film Festival, the next night was a night with their team and showing this. So we've, the projects have been in conversation, um, but there was no specific collaborative cr connection, but obviously we were, um, you know, it was meaningful to see Karski in that context, and there's a much larger um, Americans in the Holocaust exhibit, and a, one of the curators of that, uh, uh, Danny Green, who, who's based in Chicago at the Newbury Library, was a good friend to our production when we were running the play in Chicago. So there's a lot of, like, relationships there in terms of just how Karski's, how the story of Karski is moving through the world. How many of you have seen U.S. and the Holocaust? How many of you have seen the series? It's really excellent. I watched it on Yom Kippur this year. That was what I did, besides streaming services. But we spoke about this. I think that if you're interested in learning more about how this could happen, right, how Jankarski could go to 
world leaders and, and the allies not in not taking traction, that will help, I think, with a little more context, right? Yeah, we also have, um, you know, I didn't bring it up here to sell it, but I, I will share because I think it's a valuable resource. We have a, a published volume that Georgetown University Press has put up that has the play script and film stills in it, but it has a lot of other contributions about Karski and his legacy from Madeleine Albright and Timothy Snyder, Amanata Forna, um, Samantha Power, and others, and it's a really, um, it's, a, it's available and it's a really, it's another, uh, people are turning to it, I think, we feel really fortunate that it's a tool for a kind of wider lens into Karski. The, play, the question is, did we, the, the doing the play in Poland, so thank you for that question. We uh, did an early workshop of the play when it was still an ensemble play in Poland and were there for a week and learned a lot about that. And we have plans to bring the play to Poland this winter. So we're next going to Berkeley Rep in California and then, um, as you can imagine, that those have been postponed a couple times first due to COVID, but as you can imagine, the complexity of touring the show, the current plan is to bring it to four cities in Poland in January and February, which is a very um, moving and uh, complicated process. And I guess just in terms of the reaction, the film has also been screened, and maybe Eva, you wanna talk about the, the, that um, for students at the University of Warsaw. So we um, brought the film. I had actually been doing some volunteer work in uh, Warsaw. I speak Polish, and when the war broke out, and very much motivated by, you know, living with this project even from that, you know, for a year and a half, nearly two years, I was absolutely motivated by Karski's call to action. What can you do? What can I do? What can we all do that we're not already doing? And so I, you know, did my small contribution, but while I was there, uh, a fiscal sponsor for the film and also partners with the, with the stage productions, the Young Karski Educational Foundation. And they have a branch in the US but also in Warsaw. So I connected with them in Warsaw. And together we brought, um, it, was a, a work, it wasn't the final film yet, but very close to it, to the University of Warsaw, to their um, international school, uh, their, their school, for school of international relations. And we had um, a very captive, targeted audience. Um, we also had a survivor from the Warsaw Ghetto who was on the panel with me, along with a reporter who had been embedded in Ukraine. So she was very much talking about how everything is so relevant right now. And disheartening to um, Kristina Burzinska, who was the, the uh, survivor, and she's out there trying to, to use, still use her message and, and to, to try to you know, extend and share what her experiences were. And just, I could see she was just had a very heavy heart and even actually she had to step away from the, the end of the film. She had to collect herself for about 15, 20 minutes before we could actually start the panel and just feeling like the world hasn't listened. And so, um, you know, we, it, 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 as you were saying, Lisa, I think very much, you know, the messages of this film are so relevant. From, they were speaking to me at that time about what's going on in Ukraine, which still is going on. But even now, we're every, everything, every, you know, you read the news every day and, and we feel like um, there's urgency in, in, in sharing these lessons. Thank you. I, I, just, I guess just to one last thing, I think that the short answer is it's very complicated, the re reactions in Poland, because Karski is a, 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 a kind of heroic figure to many there, and there are many more, proportionately more students who learn about him, but we've experienced even already, there's, of course, it's a very complicated kind of political time, and there's people who are interested in telling in how Karski's story is told and what aspects are focused on, and we do get, feedback and notes on this is wonderful but wouldn't it be great if there was a little less of this and a little more of that and so I think um, we recognize in planning to go to Poland this winter that we're going in a in a, both a time where there are incredible echoes of a history that are that Poland is deeply involved with and where there's a political climate that is um, you know is extremely complicated in terms of um, some of the issues that this that, that it surfaces and that's part of what I hope you know for our we want to get in this country we're really hoping to get 
this story out of just these wonderful liberal progressive centers and urban centers and into other parts of the country where it's a different conversation. The James Bond line is a, uh, a line that Karski said, but, it, but it's also, a, in, in my opinion, we use it as a um, little bit of a meta-textual uh, conversation with a lot of people who would prefer the story to be told a little more simply and a little more action-oriented that sort of, you know, makes him superhuman in the way that perhaps Art Spiegelman made, you know, his, was in conversation with that notion of, of, a, of a superhero um, in Mouse, you know, um, and Karski, it's of course completely anathema to Karski's notion of himself as an insignificant little man in relation to the horrors that he witnessed, so it, it's, it's an interesting dynamic in that, in that way. No such thing. Question is, how much exposure has it had to political leaders across our country? It's had. You're talking about this film or the, the, the or the play? Yeah. I think not as much as we hope it will, but we do feel fortunate that there's. Um, a group of people uh, that include Speaker Pelosi and Congressman Raskin and government, Governor Pat Quinn, who was a student of Karski's, um, who've been, uh, Samantha Power, people like that who, who've been really behind it and who I think you know, see the power of, of it. We would love it to be, a, again, a kind of, we really see this piece as not a partisan political piece at all and we were very, very intentional about that and I think it's really, important in this moment for us to think about that in terms of how we want it seen and for it not to, we were trying to be very, very faithful to Karski's words and not use it in, in an instrumental way for other kinds of messaging or agendas. But it's, so we, we hope it will get in front of more. I don't know if you want to talk about plans for it being aired, but that should help. We, we do have plans, they're, they're ever evolving, but you know, as thank you for having us, it's important to share this film at festivals like this and with audiences and engage with, with you all. Um, so they, there will be more festivals tomorrow. It's the St. Louis International Film Festival. Um, there will be others you know, throughout the year. Um, it will be on PBS Great Performances mid-April, uh, around That's the time. That's applause worthy. Um, uh, Bravo. So stay tuned, but around the time of Yam Hoshoa, so mid-April, and also um, hooking to the 80th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, we are hoping to have it out um, theatrically in the new year around Holocaust Remembrance Day, which is January 27th, in New York, in LA, other cities. Um, and then there's the great hope of just sharing the film with institutions um, and schools and universities and anybody who really wants it, um, as well as um, working on a, a school curriculum so that we just really hope to engage with audiences in, in the most kind of impactful ways. But we welcome you know, your feedback and, and any kind of um, interest you may have in, in sharing the film as well. Wonderful. Let me take one more question. Oh my gosh. Hi. Oh, Patrice. Hi. Hi. So this is such an emotional film. There is so much um, deeply affecting content. And I'm wondering, as you're watching the, the film again, as you're experiencing it when you're making it, are there scenes that, that really you just, maybe they're different each time you watch it, but that I'll just, just just jump in to say that when we were filming this on set... Oh, we need the question. Oh, um, gosh, I, I, I won't do I'll do it. justice. Well, are there any scenes, do you have certain scenes that are either favorite scenes or scenes you're watching and each viewing, you're, you're taking new things from them? Is that kind of what you said? What, 
What I would just also just to, to preface to say we had so we filmed it for a week in a in a soundstage in Brooklyn with a crew of about 20, 24, 25. And um, amazing talent, as you've already kind of pointed out in terms of TJ Austin, he's our grip who did the lighting, um, our sound. Uh, composer Rock Lee, who you know we were lucky to inherit from the play, and then worked together with Derek and Jeff um, to score it for the film. And so I would say, and, and I, our editor um, Brandon Bray, who also did a wonderful job, he said to me because he was getting all the cuts, you know, and he had to kind of decide on which take, etc. And he said, normally on other films he's worked on, in between takes, there's a cacophony. There's like a, you know, a madness to fix that, fix that. There's like some, you know, a different kind of energy. And he said, it was amazing. There was like such reverence and respect on the set. And I would just say that everyone that has worked on this project has actually thanked us to be a part of it. Um, from our colorist, from, you know, so, so I do feel like all of us feel like this is something so much bigger than ourselves. And, um, you know, I truly feel like it's a privilege to be able to work on this and to work with, you know, such collaborators. And so, um, you know, I'll let somebody else interject in terms of scenes, but like my scenes are very specific. It's, it's a glance of, of, of of David, it's a certain lighting, you know, where it kind of looks like an eye to me when he's bearing witness in the Warsaw Ghetto. So it's not a scene per se, but it's like a, a confluence of sound or lighting or the acting or a movement of a hand that just moves me. Yeah, um, for me personally, it's just today I found myself um, newly emotional watching uh, Karski watch um, sit at the Kennedy Center um, and watch in memory of those I loved who are no more. And thinking about Paula trying to experience something in her imagination, the same way that Ziegelboim tries to appeal to our um, public imaginations to imagine the horrors that are happening. And, and the, just, just knowing the process and the mystery of their relationship, which it, you know, to, to us who have done a lot of research on it, that it, it remains so. To see all of that captured in a still frame of David um, trying to imagine being there is um, is really for me a really profound experience, and and that's and that and that it, um, and I found myself thinking about that today. I'll be fast. I think we're at time, but he's the director here. Um, no, I, I I think for me, actually, Patrice, and you'll appreciate this given the beauty of of your film and the work you're doing. I think the um, it's actually how much we learn about this piece through seeing our students and young people and their, how they're listening to it and responding to it and applying it to their lives in the moment. We've been privileged. We have a course called Bearing Witness, the Legacy of Jan Karski Today. And the sort of point of it is to bring students together, and we hope this will expand into really a much larger platform. But to across, it's not a Jewish studies course, it's across disciplines and lots of cultural backgrounds, and they're pretty fired up, we find, like pretty emotional, pretty raw, and it's very urgent and immediate, and that, like how they tune in to their own kind of, whether it's activist spirit or their own sense of truth with it, is really a lens through which we're experiencing it. So that's what we hope to continue to do. Um, we, you know, we're so over, but you can find everybody outside. I just want to say this. Um, I have to say something to you all and then to everybody about our festival. Mm. So the first thing is, Eva, you used the words privilege, and I feel also like this has been such a privilege to share your film and to share it with all of you, and I hope all of us feel this is a moment we'll always carry with us. This is a singular experience, so thank you for venturing, for traveling to be here with this remarkable film. Thank you so much. Thank you for Um, oh, yes, this is worthy. I, I'm standing with them. It's true. Um, and this is a 34th annual Boston Jewish Film Festival. I want you to know um, that we have a final screening tonight. Um, 
we're going through Wednesday night in person, so our last, uh, the screening you can still catch today at seven o'clock at the West Newton Cinema is called Alegria. It's an amazing Spanish film. We have screenings going through Wednesday night of this week. Um, we have Louis Chevalier for our closing night film. It's a documentary film about the life and legacy of the celebrated mime Marcel Marceau at the Coolidge Corner Theater on Ooh. Wednesday night. Um, and Mars and Louis is the the grandson, and Patrice O'Neill and members of the Trio Life Synagogue are with us. Anyway, thank you for joining us, um, and have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.